As soon as you say meat glue, you immediately feel weird. Like, what kind of monster would glue meat together? And the headlines you see go by certainly make it seem sinister. But let's take a closer look at this marvel of modern cuisine and see why it's actually amazing and nothing to be afraid of. And something you interact with all the time. First off, what even is meat glue? Well, it's not actually really a glue at all, not in the traditional sense you might think of. It's actually an enzyme called transglutaminase that can connect different proteins together, so long as they contain some glutamine or lysine amino acids, which a lot of proteins, especially those in muscle tissue, do. To that end, you're actually full of transglutaminase, and it's one of many enzymes that your body uses to connect its various tissues together. And while you can get animal-derived transglutaminase for culinary use, most often we use a natural bacteria that happen to produce transglutaminase. We grow the bacteria in massive bioreactors, and then extract and purify the enzyme for use in the kitchen. Much like producing wine or beer, but instead of alcohol, we get an enzyme as our product. This enzyme is usually diluted in a carrier like casein or milk protein, as the enzyme is incredibly potent and you only need a tiny bit. Now, you might be worried that if you eat it, you'll glue your insides together, but fear not, like most enzymes, heat it up and it turns off permanently. And it gets destroyed by your stomach acid. More importantly, it takes a while to work, even though it's potent. So for the demos you'll see today, I had to leave the samples for 12 to 24 hours for the gluing to happen fully. But while handling the stuff, it is important to not breathe the powder in as it's still in its active state, and you wouldn't want it in your lungs. But again, once it's cooked, it's harmless. So much so that manufacturers don't need to declare its use in most cases, as it's not considered a filler or additive as it's destroyed in the final cooking process after it's done its job. Speaking of which, what sort of things is transglutaminase used in? Well, kinda everything. Anytime you want to hold proteins together and give them a more appealing look. The classic example is holding lower quality parts of beef together to form pseudo steaks. This has caused a bit of anger by consumers because you occasionally are sold something as if it was something else, since the final product does look and taste like a higher quality steak. Other times it's less severe and they just use it to kind of pretty up cuts of meat to make them look more perfect. Or make steaks out of things that don't normally come in fillet form, like chicken or fish. Other examples include imitation crab meat, smoked meats, fish balls, and some sausages, especially if you want to minimize filler like breadcrumbs. But for me, the most exciting uses of transglutaminase in the culinary world come from outside of the grocery store. Because you can use it to stick different unrelated proteins together, chefs have really put it through its paces. Scallops with chicken skin, bacon wrapped steaks, noodles made of shrimp, sheets of radish, and so much more. Today I'll be taking you through three similar recipes of my own creation that are absolutely delicious and also a lot of fun. This was my first time using meat glue and I had an absolute blast. I'm essentially using this as an excuse to get used to using it, so that once our spider silk project is further underway, I can use it to help make strong fibers, but that's for another day. For today I'll be using a brand of transglutaminase called Moo Glue, which worked really well and was very easy to use. I tried to vary the recipes by ingredients, techniques, and textures to show off the versatility of meat glue, but know that this really only scratches the surface. So without further ado, let's jump right in. First up, what I'm calling dragon eggs. They're a hollow shell of meat with an egg yolk in the center that is cooked by the sous vide method and then broiled for a bit of color. The end result is a perfectly cooked medium rare shell with a soft boiled yolk in the middle. To make them, we start with the outer shell. For my first round of these, I used a mixture of steak, pork loin, and bacon, but in my second round, I used pure pork loin. Both worked equally well, so you can customize this with whatever meats and ratio of them you'd like. And don't feel like you need to stick to terrestrial sources. Fish and seafood work just as well. Whatever the case, we need to reduce the particle size so that the final shell is smooth, but we don't want to paste. Think half centimeter or smaller pieces. So start chopping and mixing the meat until it's a nice, even consistency that when gently pressed flat gives a smooth sheet with no obvious chunks. Once everything was processed, we can season with salt and pepper, and then we add the moo glue. Fair warning, I cook like a grandma, so my measurements tend to be a glug of this and a splash of that. I added a bit less than a tablespoon of the moo glue for every 250 grams or so of the meat. You can adjust this for your particular meat mix, how quickly you need the shells to be done, and how firm you want them to be. More glue makes the process happen faster and makes the mix firmer. I found that going a little heavy here helped things hold together. Once that's mixed in, we can start making the shells. I'm using some silicon half-sphere molds and a ball of tinfoil with some rice in it to form a small amount of meat dough into the half shells. The important thing here is that there's no holes and the rim is as flat as you can get it so the two halves will stick together properly. Also make sure the shell has approximately an even thickness. Once everything's formed, cover this with plastic wrap and pop these into the fridge overnight to set. While those are setting, let's prep the other two recipes. The simpler of the two starts with some chicken breast and thick cut bacon. Here we just lay out some bacon pieces, give them a light coating of the moo glue, and lay an equally sized piece of chicken on top. These are also covered in plastic wrap and put in the fridge to set. 
For the final recipe, I started with some pork loin, which is clean to remove any silver skin. The pork loin is then coarsely diced and small amounts at a time are added to a blender to form a smooth paste. Once the paste is formed, this can again be seasoned with salt and pepper, and then add some mooglu before mixing thoroughly. This time I wanted to see how well these protein mixtures can hold a shape, so I picked up some of these little piggy molds and some owl molds. The molds were filled with the pork loin and then again covered and put in the fridge to set. The next day starts with the dragon eggs, as they require a second gluing and incubation before we can cook them. First, we crack several eggs into a bowl, careful not to break any of the yolks. Carefully pick out a yolk, and all the connected egg whites should just fall right off with a gentle pinch. The yolk can then be placed into one of the half shells. Repeat until half of your shells are filled. To make a glue to attach the halves together, I mixed a generous amount of moo glue into a little bit of egg white until it made a thin paste. This can then be carefully applied to the unfilled shell halves before dropping them onto the other halves carefully. Make sure the edges are in good contact or the bond will fail before these make it to the cooking step. Once that's done, recover them and place them back in the fridge. While that's going, we can check on the other two dishes. First up, the chicken and bacon. These worked extremely well and you have to pull pretty firmly to actually make them come back apart. I chose to just fry these up in a cast iron skillet with a bit of salt, pepper, and sambal, which is a chili garlic paste, and a bit of fish sauce. For the molded pork, I've got to admit I was super impressed with how well these took the shape of the mold. There are obvious imperfections due to my technique, but there are some in here that held the detail amazingly well. For these, I chose to go with a char siu-esque marinade made from five spice, turmeric, paprika, salt, pepper, and a bit of hoisin sauce. For the piggies, I let them marinate for a few hours, but of course my camera died, so here's the same basic idea with some of the extra chicken and bacon strips. After marinating, I just baked these, and the piggies lost most of their shape. I assume the cooking process makes everything swell and distort, but they were delicious all the same. They had sort of the texture of a chicken McNugget, but much better, and made of pork. I assume you can make chicken nuggets pretty easily this way. Finally, back to the dragon eggs. After they had time to set, they were demolded, but at this stage I lost a bunch of them. About half didn't glue properly, and the two halves either fully came apart, or there was a hole in them. On the second time I tried this, one of three felt like it was actually stuck together properly at this stage. So yeah, the process definitely needs a bit of refinement. But with everything ready, we can finally cook these. To make the sous vide marinade, I first peeled and quartered two shallots, cut the ends off two sprigs of lemongrass, and peeled a knob of ginger. These were all added to a blender along with a bit of water, some pickled garlic, two beef bouillon cubes, black pepper, and the equivalent of the juice of two to three limes. Once very smooth, this mixture could be transferred to a large Ziploc bag, to which we add the uncooked dragon eggs carefully. To actually cook these, I set up my instant pot on ultra mode, which allows me to set the temperature and time. I cook these at 136 Fahrenheit for two and a half hours, but you might want to leave them a little bit longer. As I loaded the bag, I also took a moment to remove as much of the air as possible to make sure this sinks and is exposed to the water fully. To finish these off, I chose the ones that survived this whole ordeal and put them on a baking tray lined with aluminum foil, and broiled them for 2-3 to three minutes just to get a little bit of color on the outside. These are already fully cooked though. One last note is it can be a little tricky to get that perfect soft boiled center. Of the two times I tried this, the first round must have cooked a little better or the shell was a little thinner, so the yolk was actually properly soft boiled. But the second time it was still a little bit runny. And that's all there is to it really. Off camera, to accompany the dragon eggs, I made some rice noodles that I coated with the leftover marinade. Overall, the three items came together into a delicious plate that I think really highlights some of the many cool things you can do with transglutaminase. So next time when you hear about meat glue, don't be freaked out, instead consider all the cool possibilities. I've put some links to a few interesting papers and some other videos here on YouTube that show off other recipes, including a course on molecular gastronomy where I first heard about transglutaminase and its amazing culinary uses. And that's where I'll end this episode. As always, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons and channel members who make these videos possible. And if you'd like to see these projects long before they end up in videos, be sure to head over to my other social media pages, especially Instagram. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.